Today I'm speaking with Liz Phillips as part of a series of interviews with practitioners of experiential psychotherapy. In this series, we interview a wide variety of experiential therapists so as to compare and contrast the thinking and techniques of different experiential schools. So Liz, you specialise in IFIO. And first of all, can you let our audience know, for those who don't, what IFIO is? Yeah, so thanks for having me, Rachel. Um, so yes, IFIO is the internal family systems uh, couples therapy model. And what and so that's IFS, internal family systems, and IFIO stands for intimacy from the inside out. And this is a model that Tony Herbine Blank developed out of um, a bunch of different models, you know, primarily IFS. Um, she's also drawn from imago therapy and family systems and uh, neurobiology um, to develop this couple's protocol. Well, I love the sound of that. And when I was reading on your website, it was making me all excited. And if I could you know, add another 20 years and have another career, that might encompass that. <laughs> so, Wouldn't take you that long. <laughs> So thank you for that, Liz. And so do you consider IFIO to be experiential? So, you know, I, I'm curious about what experiential means. I mean, yes, the model, you know, we do talk about it as an experiential model um, in that, you know, we are not just doing psychoeducation with couples um, in our sessions. We are actually um, orchestrating a new experience we're really helping them to identify in the moment, in session, um, you know, what happens when they try to have conversations? What, you know, what's going on when a conflict arises? And then ideally helping them to do that differently in session. So it's a very present moment um, working through the model. So in that way, it's experiential. And, and all of that that you said, um in regards to it, it being experiential, you know, that's how I you know, would define experiential, being you know, the ability to keep the client or the clients for, for your couples in the present and to, to allow them to have you know, almost like a moment by moment embodied experience, if you like. Yes. Yeah. And I would say, you know, what's so interesting about this model is that they're kind of doing two different kinds of experiencing, um, or maybe not two different kinds, but two different um, uh, ways. So one is really learning to experience themselves in an embodied way, and then learning to experience, you know, what it's like to be in relation. So there's there's this sort of observational gap and embodied gap of, oh, this is what it feels like when I'm having this experience that may be triggered by my partner. And this is what our impact is on each other. And I can feel it right now. And so you, I love that word embodied. You know, that's exactly what this is about. Yeah. And kind of to, to, again, to help our audience to have a, a better sense of that, you, you quickly were giving some instances earlier about IFIO and how you you explain how you see it as experiential and what you do but is there a, a a brief example that you could share with us to to help understand you know what it could look like what it, what that would be for a couple experience it or even as or for therapists to 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 be supporting their clients in this way right well, you know, the first thing I would say is because it, you know, we draw heavily on the IFS internal family systems thinking that, you know, we, we are, we are made of parts, you know, that that is actually the baseline. We don't have a monolithic personality. We have different parts and those different parts can be recruited into different roles, depending on the context and the environment, what's required. And so, you know, as we know, as therapists, the, the more trauma there is, you're going to have parts that maybe take on extreme jobs um, to protect, the, you know, the person that um, that's had the trauma if they were not able to process the trauma or have a trusted adult around. And so, um, you know, in a session, we are starting with that concept of 
there's a bunch of systems in the room and those systems are made of parts. So there's, you know, mine is the therapist and then each of theirs individually and then the system that they're kind of creating together. So, you know, if I were to say what that looks like in the therapy room, um, I don't know, I'm going to take an example from my own life and I'll say what, what, would, what it would look like if I was treating myself right. and my partner. Yeah. Perfect. So, you know, the other day, for instance, um, my partner, uh, the screen door came off the tracks and I had been going in and out all day. And the first thing out of his mouth was, what did you do? And, <laughs> you know, so, but he was, he was in a part that was frustrated. And the first thing that I did was get defensive. And then I froze him out after that, wouldn't talk to him. So if, if he and I came in to the therapy room, you know, I would get really curious with each person about what, what got you activated. And when that thing happened, what did you tell yourself? So when my partner said, what did you do? What I told myself was I'm being blamed and it's not my fault and I'm being seen as the culprit. And that has a lot of resonances for me in, in my history with my mother. But I might not be so aware of that in the moment. In the moment, I'm just aware that, you know, the story I'm telling myself is that I'm being blamed. And he's got some story going on for himself too. You know, and if I were to, I'm not gonna hazard to guess what was going on inside him, but you know, a possibility could be, Liz is not careful and she doesn't really respect my things. You know, so therefore she doesn't respect me. You know, maybe I, I, I'm not, you know, going to get the, I'm not going to get my needs met here. And people jump to those stories pretty quickly because they've been going on for a long time. So I would really slow each person down, find out what are they telling themselves when they get activated. So I would say, Liz, what happened? What activated you? And I'd say when, when he said, you know, what did you do? I would ask Liz, what did you tell yourself? And she would say, I told myself that I'm being blamed. He's always criticizing me. Um, and then I would say, what, when you tell yourself that story, what do you feel inside? What happens? And, you know, what, for me anyway, I don't think all IFIO therapists work this way, but for me, the story actually is pretty primary because once you start telling yourself a story, you're going to have a bunch of feelings. So my feelings are hurt, um, anger and, you know, d defensiveness. And then as a therapist, I'm going to ask when all that is going on inside, when you're feeling that hurt and that anger, you tell yourself you're being blamed or criticized. What is it that you say or do towards your partner? And what I say or do is something defensive, like wasn't my fault, or it was like that before I, I opened the door or, you know, stop criticizing me, something like that. And then I'm going to find out what happened for my partner. When, when Liz said that, what happened inside you? And we'll go through the same kinds of questions. The purpose of sort of finding out what happens inside is that this is the stuff that we don't see. There's a whole lot of activity that goes on inside each person in a nanosecond, less than a nanosecond. And it's been practiced. You know, this isn't my first rodeo of having these feelings and not his first rodeo of having his feelings, these got enacted a long time ago in our families of origin. More than likely, you know, it's pretty rare that that isn't a repeat of something that's already going on historically. And as we know from neurobiology, in order to make ourselves feel safe, our reactions have to be fast. So the brain is not discerning and going, is that what's happening? The amygdala, your alarm system is saying, this is what's happening. You're in danger, act now. So I fire off my missile of defensiveness. He has a, his whole process inside and he's gonna fire off some missile and it might be defensiveness or explanation or who knows what it is. But we're not actually listening to each other. So in therapy, by slowing it down and asking what happened inside, we are now getting information about what's really going on. And so, it's a very slow process in slowing that down and getting each person to go inside and really figure out what was happening for me. As my partner's listening and I say something like he's always criticizing or, you know, he's trying to blame me, he might go inside and go, that's not what was happening for me at all, because he may have been lost in feeling like Liz doesn't respect me. 
So now he's hearing something about me he didn't know and vice versa. And I'm, you know, as I hear that, that might change something for me. And, you know, as I hear that he thinks that I don't respect him, that's not how I feel at all. And so that might surprise me. But what we really are learning in that moment is that we have these reactive ways of talking to each other. Defense, counter defense, let's just say. So that would be the first, you know, part of the process in, in working with IFIO is how do you two handle things when there's conflict? Because how people talk to each other then just starts to become a feedback loop. And it creates this negative cycle. You know, as soon as I hear his defense, I'm going to get more defensive and vice versa. And eventually it's just going to drive us apart. And then we're going to start telling more stories about what that means. As couples start to really see, oh, I have a way of reacting. And it's because I was feeling like this and I was telling myself this. We then help them understand the part of them that reacts, first of all, is a part. It's not all of them. I'm not defensive all the time. I have a defensive part. And, um, and then we depathologize it for them because actually our reactive parts may do destructive things, but they always have good intentions. And that's an IFS basic principle. And same in IFIO. So I might, as the therapist, say, Liz, this part of you that gets defensive, what's it hoping to do for you, actually? What's it really trying to do? And I might say something like, um, it's trying to let him know I'm not a bad person. It's hoping that he can see I didn't do this on purpose or that I'm okay. So that intention makes a lot of sense, right? So now I can make sense of that for my client and say, well, that makes sense, doesn't it? And then I might say, what this part of you that gets defensive, what's it afraid would happen if it didn't get defensive? And then you start to really get into the meat of the matter, because I might at first say, well, if I don't get defensive, I'm going to get railroaded. I'm going to get criticized. And as the therapist, I might ask, so why is criticism a terrible thing for you? What would happen if you were criticized? And then I might say, well, that doesn't feel good. You know, I, I spent my life being criticized. And then I would keep going and say, you know, say more about that. When were you criticized? What was that like for you? And there's, a, there's always a historical antecedent. So if I was soaking in criticism when I was little and no one protected me or defended me or, you know, or there was no repair, I am going to develop a part that takes on a role that has to defend me because there was no one else there to really hear what was really going on inside me. So it starts to make sense of behaviors for people, which really helps couples, um, it's de-shaming. You know, they don't feel so ashamed of how they behave. And we're not telling them to change their behavior. So it's not a compliance model. It's not saying, you know, if you were a little less defensive, Liz, maybe, you know, your partner wouldn't react that way. I could maybe do that for two or three times. And, but if I'm not really understood about why I'm defensive, that defensive part is gonna act out again. So this model really helps people understand that there is a good reason and that there was a wound and that they are trying to protect that very vulnerable place. This part that reacts is trying to protect something vulnerable. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I'm, I'm loving all of that, Liz, and just the, you know, I'll often say to clients, it's like why we do what we do, right? Yeah. And so this is, and I love the the compassion of the you know, the the noble qualities and the original intention of that part was something that that actually was to support and help you, but then it became defended over as it collected evidence for if someone comes and criticizes me and that piles on, that's unsafe and. And so I need to defend against that. So I, I love how you, it sounds like that work you really kind of slows that down and, and helps the couple be in the other person's shoes or perspective so that they can realise, okay, so you, you, your, your partner didn't intend to you know, make you feel blame or not enough or like it's, yeah, so that the, the needs that were really there. That's exactly right. It's really about the needs and the parts that react are hoping to get a need met, but they often don't know that there are other options because they got developed when there were no other options. Absolutely. 
And you know, something you said is really key and it's the word slow. Because if you think about this from a neurobiological perspective or somatic perspective, you know, when we're, when, when we're flooded with a feeling, um, you know, whether we go into hyper, hypo arousal or hyper, sorry, hyper or hypo arousal. I always think of hyper as up and hypo yeah. is down. <laughs> you know, we know that our cognitive functions start to go offline because at that point, thinking and discernment is a luxury as far as the organism is the concern, right? The organism is like, it's fight or flight or freeze. We need to survive. We don't have time to figure out whether that's a pussycat in the distance or a lion. We're just going to assume it's a lion. And you know, it's I do some psychoeducation around this for my clients because what they what is helpful for them to know is it's not an act of will to behave differently. We are often, you know, things happen without our permission. Our reactions are kind of happening without our permission. So as we slow it down in session, so this is where the experiential comes in, is we're starting to help them notice their own bodies. Because as they're telling the story, they're going to have a little bit of that activation, you know, that maybe their heart's racing. We'll say, you know, what are you noticing inside? Their stomach's clenched, their jaw might be tight. And as they're talking it through and going into the hopes and into the fears of these reactive parts and starting to, to make contact with what's vulnerable and starting to feel more compassion for their vulnerable parts, their system is slower. And if you take their uh, sort of the temperature, somatic temperature again at that point, you'll often hear, you know, this, I feel a little calmer, or I feel sad, but they don't have the same level of in intense activation. So it's happening in session as we slow everything down. Something that happens quickly at home happens very slowly in session. And so it starts to regulate their systems. Not always. Mm -hmm. But um, it's very helpful. You said that magic word, the regulation, right? It's just because we're yeah. so dysregulated. And when you were talking about you and your husband and the screen door, it's just like I'll often say, you know, it's our little kids, like because we're coming from young places when typically when we're in the amygdala hijack place of just like, you know, so little kids acting to little kids and you don't have the resources to sit and consider and have you know, be in the other person's experience and have empathy there when you're yeah. feeling so unsafe, basically. Yeah. And sometimes I'll even say to my clients, you know, it sounds, it sounds like maybe you didn't think you had other options. Mm -hmm. You know, when I hear words like I feel helpless, uh, you know, I don't know what to do. Um, you know, I can't do anything about it. That's not realistically true about an adult not always sometimes it can be true but most of the time for most of us it's not actually true but it is true for children you know adults have you know often my clients have jobs they have families you know they are they're in roles of responsibility and so I sort of gently remind them that you know it can feel that way and when I hear that I really hear maybe there's some young part of them or a time in their life where they didn't have another option and you know, would they be interested in, in considering that there might be options now that they're grown ups? Mm. And that's all, often a bit of an aha moment for them. Yeah, yeah. And then so, you know, just before I forget the other piece, so that's the, that it's actually the meat of what we do is this sort of, we call this tracking of really seeing what's happening in the, in, you know, the relationship, the, the conversations they're trying to have. And then the second part of what we do is how to help them do it differently. So the first is what's happening, and then how can we do this differently? And it, it is a process where the therapist is with them every step of the way, helping them notice inside, for instance, if they're trying to have a conversation about a topic and someone is listening, what might get in the way of listening? What parts are worried about what they're gonna hear? What parts already wanna defend? What parts are afraid of being blamed? And the same thing for the listener, to try to help the listener really speak about their experience without blaming the partner. Because, I mean, it's not, you know, our, our partners are going to step all over our tender buttons. You know, that's going to happen. We will trigger each other, but they are not the cause. You know, the tender buttons got put there a long time ago. And so, so you know, what would be helpful for, let's say, in the example I gave with me and my partner is, you know, 
if the therapist was helping me speak for what happened inside me, instead of me saying, you know, if only you to my partner, you know, well, why did you say, what did you do? Like, just don't say that. And I don't have to be so defensive. What my therapist is going to help me recognize is, it, or to help me articulate is when I heard you say, what did you do? What I told myself was I'm being blamed for this. And I felt so much pain because it reminded me of my mom and we never repaired. And it's the last thing I want with you. I don't want you to think I'm a bad person. It matters what you think of me. That would be a very different statement than attacking him for what he said. Now he can hear about my vulnerabilities and he's not on the hook in the same way, which increases the odds of him being able to listen and either apologize or just reflect and say, you know, that that does sound painful. That was, in, in fact, that is what happened. You know, he had, he's done um, this kind of work. And so he was able to say, that sounds really icky what you're describing to me. Mm. And that was so helpful to hear because I felt understood. Yeah, yeah. And uh, as you're talking about this, I can't help but think of MVC, nonviolent communication. Liz, uh, just like that, you know, speak, you know, it's noticing and making your I statements of just like yes. making it about you and then bringing in the empathy and just saying what your experience is. And then actually making that request of just like, this is actually what I need. Like, I, I don't need you to criticize me and shame me. <laughs> just like put me in that place. I just, this, this dialogue, it's just this connection of, you know, I need you to see my hurt or whatever, however that comes up. Yes. And, you know, um, it's interesting. I think, you know, this is one place, and I don't know if the IFIO is the only model that does this, but, you know, when you were saying how to make a request, this is what I need. And I think that's really deeply important is to help clients learn how to make requests. And maybe this is also what happens in NVC too, but you know, the other piece that's deeply important for IFIO, and I haven't found this in, in any of the models that I've trained in is the understanding that even if you make a request, your partner's not always available. Oh yeah. <laughs> right? Because, yeah. because so for instance, you know, I don't actually think it's realistic for me to request of my partner, don't criticize me because when my partner made that statement, he was inside his own part and that wasn't that part's intention. Mm -hmm. And so actually it wouldn't be something he could do because that's not where it came from for him. So what's more reasonable and um, that might make more of a connection between him and me is, could I get curious about what's going on for him mm -hmm. instead of asking him to change? And he might not be able to because it's not where it came from. So he won't be able to anticipate how it's gonna land on me. Could I, after I've talked about what's happening in me, learn to be more curious about what is, when you said that to me just now, what were you hoping for? Or what was going on inside you? Mm -hmm. yeah. Because if I hook my not feeling this way on him changing, I'm gonna set both of us up for failure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because how, what he's reacting to or how he's reacting is gonna land on me in ways that he doesn't anticipate and he can't. It's, it's too much for another adult to anticipate that. But if I can just stay in the moment and stay curious, we can work through that moment. Does that make sense? And so I just want to, you, you seem to have alluded to it a, a little bit already, but just to, to ask um, a little bit more explicitly, um, it sounds like you don't practice pure IFIO. You're incorporating other, because you, you said something earlier about, okay, I don't know if all IFO therapy, IFIO therapists would do this, but you know, I in, include these other pieces. And so are you integrating other modalities into the way that you work with clients? I can see you nodding. Your so, so no, I don't know why I'm nodding. Okay. Well, yes and, yes and no. Okay. So the first thing I want to say is, let me go back to that moment where I said, I don't know if other IFIO therapists do this. So what I meant was, you know, there's a series of questions that we do ask and we're trying to figure out what informs the reactivity. And the questions are, you know, what story are you telling yourself? What's happening in your body? What emotions are you feeling? Maybe even what's your first impulse? Because sometimes someone has an impulse to run, but they yell. I prioritize the story in that list of questions. Some therapists will prioritize what, ha prioritize what happened in your body. They might go there first. Oh, okay. 
but and and I don't think there's a right or a wrong. I think it's kind of how you what your orientation is. And it's funny, you know, I was trained somatically, I was trained in sensory motor psychotherapy, but I don't go to the body first. I use the body, but I go to the story first. So that's what I meant. And mm, you know, Tony okay. Herbine Blank um, goes to the body a lot and she works with the body so beautifully. And so the story is important to her too, but the body probably uh, would be the first thing on her list. So that's what I meant by that. And she's another IFIO therapist. Is that she's one? the developer of this model. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So Tony Herbine Blank developed this model. And um, you know, I was trained in emotionally focused therapy for couples work. And it the IFIO and EFT, the emotionally focused therapy, are very, very similar. They have I used to think there were two places they diverge. Now I think it might just be one. So um, they both track that negative cycle um, between uh, the couples and they both consider the relationship their client. And they're really trying to help uh, th their clients see that, you know, they've got a cycle that has them by the neck. Um, and that as they learn to really uh, understand the parts of them that are getting reactive and why, it's going to help de-escalate that cycle. So, you know, EFT is present because IFIO does the same thing. But I have to say I'm a purist with IFIO. Oh, okay. um, so, you know, it, it happens to be on much of the same track as EFT, but it is a model that does a few things differently that just make more sense in my body. And so uh, I don't use other modalities. Okay. Okay. So you are a, a purist and it sounds like a, it sounds like it, it has a lot of a space for including you know, some of these other areas that you've also you've been trained in. To well, you, right. So IFIO, IFIO itself, and maybe this is not so pure, right? That it draws on somatic uh, knowledge, it draws on neurobiology, it draws on um, attachment theory, you know, it's all in there already, you know, systems theory. Um, so maybe that's why I can say I'm a purist, but it, you, because I'm, I'm landed in a model that's drawing from a whole bunch of other places. Mm -hmm. In regards to the work that you're doing, uh, it sounds like you would say that IFIO is an experiential therapy. Is that true? And then, so is that, and because you are admittedly a purist in IFO, would you then agree that you enjoy working experientially? Yes. Very much so. I mean, I can't quite imagine what kind of therapy isn't experiential, but this is really experiential in the sense that you are in the moment with them doing something different. And um, I really enjoy that because maybe it's, you know, my impatient parts. In a way, there's a lot of instant gratification because you're, it's happening in the moment, you know, and it doesn't mean that things are always going well, but even when things aren't going well, we're, we're learning something about people's systems. They are learning about what happens inside them. And so, you know, it's a very mindful model that uh, of, observation and noticing and being with things as they are in the moment and um i find that i find it so engaging you know in the in the internal family systems model with individuals you know we are really holding a container ideally for people to get in touch with their own systems we're, we're like a, a guide but in the couples model, we are really in there with them, getting like rolling up our sleeves, getting our hands dirty, mm -hmm. um, because there's a lot going on. And so our job is to really interrupt a lot, slow down, ask them to check in a lot, um, holding the other person at the same time. So, you know, I might be talking to one person and looking at the other or, you know, just pausing and checking in. So it's very active. And I also believe that it really helps the couple, you know, as you said earlier, they kind of, we end up in our child parts when we're in these conflicts. And so you're the adult in the room. And so they wanna know that you are gonna keep it safe. And they are not, you know, they are, they're triggering each, each other. 
when there's an individual in you, there's not all the people that trigger them in the room, but their trigger is right there beside them in the room. And so they need to know that there's someone in there who's going to make sure that that space is safe. Mm -hmm. And so I'm actively doing that by continuously letting them know I'm there. I'm here to help. Let's slow down. And, um, and I love that. I feel like we're in it together. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, you said something at the very beginning about our own parts, you alluded to, you know, the therapist having parts. And this is one of the things that this model IFS and IFIO do really, really well is, you know, in the trainings, especially is we take a lot of time continuously to look at our own parts as therapists. And I know that in my own experience training in therapy, I understood what countertransference was, but I mm -hmm. never did work. I didn't bring it to therapy. I brought it to supervision because I had to, but I really didn't get it. And in IFIO and IFS, I now am so aware of my part. So they pop up in session and I will slow down and say, hang on everyone. I have a part here and I just need to just take a moment to find out what's going on inside my own mm -hmm. system. And the value of that is that I'm modeling slowing down. Uh, I'm modeling, you know, saying what I need so that they can learn how to do that. And then I can speak for it. Um, and then we can see how everyone else feels as I've spoken for it. How's that landing? So we are doing the work of learning how to speak and listen differently by me modeling what's happening and engaging them in that conversation. So, I mean, ideally I'm not making them, you know, therapize me. I'm no, just yeah. in what's there. Yeah. So I'm still yeah. in that that role, but I'm showing them what's possible. Yeah. So you talked about a lot of the, I can see like even in your body language and yeah, how, how much you enjoy working this way experientially. Is there anything that is, you find difficult in working experientially with clients? Is there a particular challenge in working this way with clients that you found, Liz? So probably I would say it's again, you know, the challenges are always about my own parts. Mm. You know, before IFS and IFIO, I had a, a, a part I was unaware of because I didn't know I had parts that would think about my couples is challenging. Oh. And now I think about what part's getting activated in me that has that idea. Because, you know, for sure people are in distress, but if, you know, if what, what I can find difficult at times is let's say, you know, so my mother um, had a really angry presentation when I was growing up and she has a severe trauma history. She's passed away now, but she mm -hmm. had a severe trauma history. And so, you know, the, the, her first line of defense was fury. And it was terrifying for me, but my dad was a very, is a very quiet, you know, easygoing man. So when I'm in a, in a session, if there is a, a, a heterosexual couple where a woman has, you know, a, a presenting part that presents with anger, I will have a part that gets scared. That's not about her having a problem with anger. That's about me having a part that gets scared. If a man in that, in, in a room yells at me, I'm fine. I don't have a reaction. I can stay present. I can get really curious about the part of him that's angry. I've had some people say some pretty salty things uh, that, you know, could be really offensive and I, it, I can stay open and curious. Mm. So, th so this is how I know this is about my own system and really not about the other person. And so as soon as I notice that my frightened part is here, I can go in and just, you know, quickly let her know I'm, I'm here in the session. Mm -hmm. And that when someone, when a woman is angry, she's not your mom. And there's a lot of pain there. That's why the anger's here. And we're going to find out about the pain and don't worry. Cause I'm here and you don't have to be in the session, little one. So, you know, that, that, those are the times that I can find things challenging, but it's, it's part of the process. And now I'm appreciating it because you know, my clients are teaching me so much as I notice my own parts pop up. So probably I would say it's again, you know, the challenges are always about my own parts. Mm. You know, before IFS and IFIO, I had a, a, a part I was unaware of because I didn't know I had parts that would think about my couples is challenging. Oh. And now I think about what parts getting activated in me that has that idea. Because, you know, for sure, people are in distress, 
but if you know if what what I can find difficult at times is let's say you know so my mother um, had a really angry presentation when I was growing up and she has a severe trauma history she's passed away now but she mm -hmm. had a severe trauma history and so you know the, the, her first line of defense was fury and it was terrifying for me but my dad was a very is a very quiet you know, easygoing man. So when I'm in a, in a session, if there is a, a, a heterosexual couple where a woman has, you know, a, a presenting part that presents with anger, I will have a part that gets scared. That's not about her having a problem with anger. That's about me having a part that gets scared. If a man in that, in, in a room yells at me, I'm fine. I don't have a reaction. I can stay present. I can get really curious about the part of him that's angry. I've had some people say some pretty salty things uh, that, you know, could be really offensive and I, I can stay open and curious. Mm. So, th so this is how I know this is about my own system and really not about the other person. And so as soon as I notice that my frightened part is here, I can go in and just, you know, quickly let her know I'm, I'm here in the session mm -hmm. and that when someone, when a woman is angry, she's not your mom and there's a lot of pain there. That's why the anger is here. And we're going to find out about the pain and don't worry because I'm here and you don't have to be in the session, little one. So, you know, that, that, those are the times that I can find things challenging, but it's, it's part of the process. And now I'm appreciating it because you know, my clients were teaching me so much as I notice my own parts pop up. Mm, I love that. But is there anything that you would want to say to your therapeutic colleagues out there who may be new to experiential work uh, that you would want to share with them? Some words of wisdom from, from you, Liz. You know, if I were to talk to other therapists, so I have done straight up talk therapy where I go in myself as a client and just talk about my experiences and, and the needle has not moved for me. And then a long time ago, I had a therapist who I ended up staying with for 20 years and, you know, she was trained somatically. And so we would, you know, I could feel the difference between our sessions where I just, you know, talked about everything that I needed to talk about. And then when she would actually go in and we would do somatic work, they were like night and day. So I would say helping people really understand experience, not understand that's so cognitive, yeah, but yeah, yeah, have that embodied experience of the here and now, because I think especially in Western culture, we're so cut off from our bodies. You know, I didn't know I had one for a very long time. And, you know, now I know I grind my teeth because I didn't even know my jaw hurt and it was hurting. <laughs> Right, we're so un un um, clued into these all of these um, somatic signals, and one of the things I also say to my clients. So yes, I would I would encourage other therapists to to you know get to know. And there's but there's a there's a buffet. You know, IFS is one. Uh, sensory motor psychotherapy is another one. Um, you know, s somatic experiencing. There's all kinds. Mm -hmm. um, Emotionally focused therapy is also really focuses on what you're feeling inside, the emotion of it. And so you do get an embodied sense. But the more embodied, I would say, the better, the more mindful, the more noticing, the better. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I, I completely, I, I suppose, because I, I, I try to stay away from the realm of talk therapy, like probably within the first, I want to say six to 12 months, um, from my memory <laughs> a long time ago when I started this work, I realized how ineffective talk therapy was. So I started going after these more somatically based experiential therapies and the, you know, you know Hakomi coherence therapy, my medical Qigong work. So all of these in, you know, in support of you finding that bringing the client out of their head. And I'll say to clients, it's just like, so your, your brain, takes up from the neck up it takes up this much real estate from the neck down it's a lot more but where do we usually hang out right and it was just like it's iq versus eq and i have yet to find someone's eq that constructs and tells stories 
the way that your IQ does. And I'm like, let's flip that percentage for you. If you're working with me, I want you to be more informed from the neck down than you are up here because this one lies. <laughs> Just... Well, you know, if, if I may, do we have time? I want to share a little. Sure, absolutely. Bit. Yeah. So in IFS and IFIO, you know, we, we might call those storytelling parts or intellectual parts or analyzer parts. And I know I was working with um, a couple once, you know, where there was a lot of trauma. And in my experience, you know, the people compartmentalize different experiences when they've been traumatized, especially, I mean, generally it happens because there's no one there to process with them. So they have to, they have to scatter that experience across a bunch of different places. And so one couple I was working with, you know, a white heterosexual couple, um, the, the woman um, had, was very bright. And often I find, I don't know if this is a thing. I wonder if this has ever been studied in my sample group of my clients. Almost to everyone, the, the, the more severe the trauma, the more intellectually developed. Like Oh, yeah. I actually have noticed that too. Liz. So, Again, it's like not, yeah. This is not, this not scientific. It is, yeah. It's at, just, yeah, anecdotal. Like what anecdotal. Yeah. And so, you know, she had lots of great airtight stories about her life that, you know, who am I to disagree? I wasn't there. And as we started to move into IFS, because she came with me from old models and, and continued into the new ones, mm. when we were doing an IFIO session and the parts tell stories very differently. You know, a young part isn't going to use expensive words and uh, analyze it in quite the same way. And so, you know, when you're actually hearing the parts experience on their own terms mm. and one of her parts had no idea that she was married. Wow. Oh my goodness. And when she learned that she was married and someone loved her, I'm getting goosebumps just telling yeah, you. Yeah, I just like wow. the whole system got updated and shifted something in her that had felt so unlovable. Yeah. Didn't believe that was ever going to happen for her. And so was still living in that belief that it, it wouldn't and didn't know that it had. And I love what you said there about the, the stories from those parts those, and the word tenders coming up as well as young. It's just like, because that language is you know, to be like, I, that's what I call the limbic language, right? And it's, it's the more emotional languages in, you know, that's, that's where it, we're simplifying things because we don't have the sophistication of, of like our adult constructs that have come from there. So yeah. it's still a story. Thank you for saying that, Liz. It's still a story, but it's not constructed in the same way with that sophistication. And, and I tend to believe it's more of a direct description of experience. Mm. In every, you know, the story will never be accurate because. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we see through our lenses and so forth and yeah. But the felt sense is valid. And so when I hear people start to, you know, say things like, well, you know, my parents had money problems and I'll say, but did your six-year-old know that? You know, the six-year-old doesn't really know that. Yeah. And then we are able to ask that one to, to, to sort of the one who knows about the money problems to soften back. So we can actually get direct access to the six-year-old who just was absorbing the anxiety and what the six-year-old is saying is mommy or daddy or whoever their caretaker is, is unhappy. And I need to, I need to, you know, make them laugh. That's mm. the six-year-old's Yeah, Yeah. It's my job to, to make them better or not. So the, you know, they wouldn't have known they were stressed out about money, but that's what the, the little one was experiencing. So, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for that piece, Liz. And I'm just wondering, as we start to wind down here today, as I'd love to keep on talking, but in the interest of time, um, do you have any, is there anything coming up for you that you would like to, to share with the audience, anyone interested in, in your work, either working, you, I know you do some teachings and workshops or um, any of your, any I don't know if you've got any more any books on the horizon or anything like that. So anything that you you know, how can people contact you and um, and and what is there anything coming up? Basically, yeah. sorry. 
Well, feel no, that's great. Thank you for asking. Feel free to put my website on. I don't know. Will there be notes underneath the video or something? People can contact me at LizPhillipsTherapy.ca. Okay. Yeah. Two L's. I'm, I'm always happy to talk to people as long as they're patient with my response time. I'm always happy to connect with people. Um, and, you know, I, I have over the last two years done my own sort of IFIO informed workshops, mm -hmm. but now I'm working directly with Tony Herbine Blank and I'm oh, wonderful. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, you know, on a, on a trainer track. And so we are developing more ways of reaching people. So there might be more two to three day workshops that people can access as uh, introductory workshops. Oh, wow. Okay. And there'll be a few of us teaching those. So I'm hoping to be one of them. And are they going to be um, online and in person or one or the other? Do you know? I don't know, but I suspect as we move, hopefully, you know, away from this pandemic and into a different place, probably both, because the beauty of online is accessibility. Absolutely. Well, yeah. I don't think that will ever disappear. I don't think we want it to, but, but there probably will be more, you know, I'm in Toronto, so I plan to do some local introductory two to three day workshops um, of IFIO through her, through the IFIO organization. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we don't have any scheduled. I do have a workshop coming up with um, Derek Scott. So he's ifsca.ca. Okay. And that's coming up in November. And it's a two day introduction to IFIO. It's IFIO informed. So anyone, you have to have some knowledge of IFS. Mm -hmm. you can't hold because yeah. I will be explaining some basic yeah. concepts. So would that be like intermediate or advanced? Uh, and for therapists in terms of the IFS background? They would need to maybe have done a PESI course or okay. maybe a course okay. with Derek Scott or read some books. They just have to understand some basic concepts around the, the three parts in IFS are managers, firefighters, and exiles mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what they do. Okay. And once they understand that, then, and it's not hard to understand, um, I, I'm happy to have them. I just won't be explaining those basic concepts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you can kind of get right into the, the meat yeah. and potatoes if you like. So, yeah. Well, thank you for that, Liz. And, and um, sorry, sorry, there's one more thing. Oh, yeah. I am developing um, public education programs. So these are not for therapists to train. This is for a therapist to send clients as a, as a group to learn about their parts, almost like setting them up for therapy so that they can then go. Oh, wow. Them. That sounds wonderful. Yeah. So you are going to be doing something that clients could uh, be informed by and yeah cool. it's in the works I'm going to do a pilot with a small group in Alberta in the fall and if that goes well I'm going to roll it out in the new year and that will be online and so anyone can come you don't have to be in a relationship people might want to come because they might want to understand what happened in their relationship so it's for everybody and it's about it is about the dynamics and what happens and all this bring it to people yeah. Well, I look forward to adding that as a resource for my own clients. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Liz. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Oh.